welcome everyone. My name is Davi. This is Stefan Chan. We are from Airbnb. And we're going to be talking about custom controllers and how we make use of them in our infrastructure. Uh, for those don't, that don't know about Airbnb, Airbnb is an online marketplace for homes and experiences. You can find homes, uh, apartments, and all that sort of stuff on Airbnb. Uh, just a quick plug, we are, hiring, uh, we are hiring for a lot of positions in infrastructure, site reliability, payments, mobile. And it's a special time to join Airbnb because we're basically in the process of changing how transforming how our entire infrastructure works. And we have offices in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Beijing, so you can pretty much work from a lot of different places. So one of the first things I'm gonna talk about is why do we use Kubernetes? So Airbnb until a few years ago used to be a very few monolithic apps. And like by monolithic apps, I really talking about a single app with millions of lines of Ruby code, Rails based, and we had a similar, uh, small, some small other services, and we are starting the process of breaking that all apart and moving into a services-oriented architecture. And we've been doing this for some time, and we already have a few hundred services. And one big thing with those services is that we used to be a chef-based, so each, uh, each service would have its own like uh, recipes and everything in Chef, and they would run on their own EC2 host. And that's very, very expensive because you end up with a bunch of machines. And we didn't have a process to auto scale those. Someone had to go manually launch new machines or things. Or if it was taking, let's say if there was a peak, you still have the same number of machines. We didn't have anything like to automatically place hosts that die. So we decided, as part of the service-oriented migration, we decided let's start moving those services also into uh, Kubernetes. Uh, Melanie, early during the keynote, talked about a little bit how we deploy things on Kubernetes. But one of the reasons we went with Kubernetes, I uh, would say that one of our main driving was actually cost. Like I said, we had one service per EC2 host. It means we couldn't pack as many services as we wanted into a single host. So with Kubernetes, we can properly more better scale those services. Let's say most services are gonna probably gonna be using like one, two CPUs and a few gigs of memory. So we can basically have a larger host and pack more bang for the buck on those. Also, another thing that Kubernetes provides us is like uh, self-healing. So if my node die, it automatically migrates uh, all the pods to a new node, and we don't have to worry about that. It's basically a known event. And we can actually even have like auto-scaling for certain services so that they can scale up and down with traffic. Uh, so let's talk about what is actually a custom controller. A custom controller is just a component that is watching objects and uh, looking at the, what is the state of those objects, what is the current state of the cluster, and maybe doing modifications to that state so that it reaches a desired state. So Kubernetes is a declarative-based system, so you declare what is the go state, and then there is a lot of things, most of those are controllers that are watching the state of the cluster and trying to move the state to that desired state. Uh, so why do we use constant controllers? Uh, at Airbnb, our main use for constant controllers is actually integrating uh, Kubernetes with external systems. For example, uh, one controller uh, that currently it's in Kubernetes is that, for example, if you have like an ELB, you want to have like a load balancer for your service, there is a co controller somewhere that basically goes and talks to AWS and provisions a controller for you. We use that we extend that concept to more things. We use it for like to integrate with service discovery or for example to provision, uh, to provision AWS resources and things like that. And you can even use it to basically make a lot of requirements about how your objects should look like and you can actually use it to do a lot of validations. You can use it to validate your objects that they have the required fields that they follow best practices. And another, uh, another particular type of controller that we use a lot is an admission controller. Admission controller is basically, it's a controller that intercepts requests after they have been authenticated and authorized. So like uh, when you do a kubectl command, you're talking to the API server, so the admission controller gets called for the API server. 
but only after it has been authenticated and authorized. So the request is basically authenticated, so you have access like to username and things like that. Why do we use admission controllers? We use admission controllers for actually a few different things, but the main one is actually for us to require a standardization of our objects. And when I talk about objects, I'm talking about things like even a pod object. I'm making sure that, uh, for example, the pod objects has all the fields that are required to be deployed within our cluster. We can also eat, we can, uh, and uh, admission controllers, they have two. They have validating and mutating uh, controllers. So you can actually, for example, the validating one, you can use just to check things in your pod spec and make sure that everything that is required is there. Or also the mutating one, you can actually use it to modify things. So for example, you can use it to inject sidecars in a pod and that sort of stuff. Another thing we use it for is that we can use it to secure our cluster. For example, we can make sure that uh, if someone is trying to deploy, like there was a keynote that talked about this, someone could actually try to deploy something from the internet to create service accounts and things like that. So we use this, we use the, uh, Validated concept controller should uh, prevent those things from happening. So we want people, uh, we want our engineers to only be able to deploy like blast uh, applications. So we use admission controllers to check for those things. Uh, so just a quick overview of the admission controller. The admission controller is operating before the object actually gets persisted or created, like before you do any change to uh, the changes to the objects are. are are persisted. So that's the part where an admission controller works. And then we have the custom controllers. They're basically operating after those steps. And I'm going to hand over to Steven to talk about uh, our specific use cases for controllers. Thanks, Davi. Uh, yeah, so now that we've covered the high level like concepts and motivations, we'll go through some of the existing use cases that we got for writing uh, admission controllers and custom controllers. So let's go through uh, how we use admission controller. First of all, uh, as Davi mentioned, you can use it for validation and mutation. However, uh, we currently only use it for validation. We find that it's uh, preferable to keep all the uh, transformation of objects uh, before apply time uh, using kubegen. Um, we, what do we validate it for? Uh, we validate the presence of standard annotations on uh, all pods that are uh, created in the cluster. Um, so these have links to, for example, uh, our CICD UI. So you can see when uh, a particular uh, pod was, or service was deployed last uh, and who deployed it. Uh, you have uh, project owner contact information. So we've got a, a database mapping uh, services to team owners. Uh, and then finally, we've got uh, links to project repos and GitHub so you can uh, view the source code um, that was corresponds to the creation of the pod. And because we have our uh, deploy and um, configuration alongside our code, uh, it's easy to view everything at once. Uh, I should also mention that uh, because of the uh, project owner contact information annotation, we can use this not only for debugging uh, incidents, but also uh, sending out automated alerts. So, we can alert uh, the owners of that particular service if their pod is consuming uh, more than their requested amount of CPU or has experience in out of memory. We also use admission controllers to uh, secure and uh, create uh, enforce best practices on a cluster. So uh, we enforce that all the container images on pods come from our single uh, trusted registry source. Uh, we also prevent uh, configurations that aren't meant to run on our clusters. So for example, we don't allow load balancer type services right now uh, because our clusters are uh, in internal facing. Uh, we don't want them to create external endpoints. Uh, finally, we uh, just use it as a prevention of footguns, such as uh, having developers deploy uh, their development services to production clusters. Okay, so we've gone through uh, admission controllers. Now we're gonna talk about some custom controllers that we built. So first off, we've got a service discovery controller. So why did we build this? Uh, we built this to integrate Kubernetes with our cluster external systems. Uh, in this case, we built it 
to integrate with SmartStack, which is our um, existing uh, ser service discovery framework. So SmartStack, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, is an open source service discovery framework. It's got a few components. Um, it's got Zookeeper, which is a distributed key value store. Uh, on the client side, you've got Synapse, which is uh, polling Zookeeper for uh, for backends for a particular service, it uses that list to configure ATA proxy, uh, which does actual load balancing when uh, the client service makes requests. On the server side, you've got uh, Nerve, which continually health checks the server side and ensures that uh, if the service is healthy, its backend is available in Zookeeper, and if it's unhealthy, that's removed from Zookeeper. So this is what it looks like uh, before Kubernetes. So what does it look like inside of Kubernetes? So uh, we need a few more pieces of information which we get from the API server. Uh, we implement this as a controller sidecar within each pod. So what that does is it's reading the uh, node port service information. Um, previously in SmartStack we expected that ports were relatively statically allocated. Uh, in Kubernetes when you create a node port service that port is randomly allocated. So you need to fetch that information. Um, and you also need the current host that uh, the pod is running on. And so you see here, the controller sidecar has replaced the role of Nerve. It still does uh, health checks to determine the readiness of the serving pod and then uh, removes it or adds it from Zookeeper accordingly. So to summarize, uh, the objects that the, this controller watches are services, pods, and nodes. The goal state is to add or remove to Zookeeper based on the health status of the pod. Okay, next up, we've got uh, what we call the deployment pruner controller. And so why did we build this one? We wanted to add additional behavior on top of deployments. Uh, so th what we want to do is enforce max pod lifespan uh, while respecting max unavailable count. So on all of our clusters, we enforce that uh, pods uh, are not around for more than 14 days. But if a service has been running 14 days without any restart of pods, we don't want to immediately take down that service. So what it does is it watches deployments, pods, and nodes, and then um, it will continuously uh, delete pods as they've reached expiration. And this is also a natural extension point for if we want to enforce any other policy around like pod expiry, or um, if we want to add like a new, um, new criteria to admission control, uh, but the pods are already running, uh, we can uh, delete those as well. Uh, third, we've got the node problem controller. Uh, again, we're trying to layer behavior on top of existing API objects. So what does the node problem controller do? Well, primarily it watches nodes and it's responsible for um, providing another layer of uh, self-healing on top of our clusters. So it works in uh, in tandem with the node problem detector, which is an upstream Kubernetes project. What the node problem detector does is it uh, health checks the underlying minion nodes and then sets conditions to uh, the nodes according to the results of the health checks. What it doesn't do is uh, provide any remediating action. Uh, so it's still up to you to add that addition on top. So no problem controller will check those conditions and add taints to nodes that have uh, undesirable conditions. And so we can use this for enforcing things like the presence of uh, Datadog or kubejm uh, daemon set pods. All right. Finally, um, we've been experimenting with using MetaController as a general purpose pattern for resilient architectures. So uh, in our keynote, uh, my colleague Melanie talked about uh, using MetaController for creating AWS custom resource definitions uh, and then replicating those to uh, provision um, IAM roles or policies. Uh, we also use it for things like alerts. So you can um, create an alerts CRD and then the alerts controller will ensure that the alert definitions are created in our external monitoring system. Okay. Now that we've gone through some, um, some of the controllers that we use, uh, we can go through practical controller tips when you're writing your own controllers. So tip number one, uh, always auto-scale your, your controllers. Uh, as your cluster size grows, um, if you're using the Go client, uh, 
you're, you're going to be maintaining a local cache of your objects. And so it's easy for that to uh, creep up on uh, memory and CPU usage as you expand your cluster. Uh, so in addition, you can also use labels and selectors to optimize your data fetch. Uh, and there are also a few like, options for uh, doing this autoscaling. You can use vertical pod autoscaler or uh, pod nanny, which is a sidecar. Um, but one important thing here to note is that pod nanny itself is kind of a controller. It's watching the nodes uh, of the cluster. Uh, and when uh, we had a case where we were using uh, Heapster and running pod nanny as a sidecar, uh, we found that Heapster was unavailable. Um, we thought that's weird. Um, Heapster is auto scaling. Uh, but actually, pod nanny, uh, pod nanny was. Uh, out of memory at that point, uh, so that made the service unavailable. Tip number two, um, definitely use the Go client. So Kubernetes supports uh, several different languages for uh, interacting with the API, but the Go client, uh, you get the latest features from upstream. You get uh, informers, which are basically a webhook framework for uh, calling, your, calling your controller, uh, indexers, which are the local cache of objects. You've got leader election, um, for high availability, event spam filter. So uh, one thing to note with larger clusters is that uh, high numbers of events can sometimes overwhelm etcd. So uh, this prevents you from uh, doing that if your controller is emitting events. Uh, you also have mock client set so that you can easily test your controller uh, by submitting fake objects that you've created. Uh, you can also import from uh, other libraries such as API machinery or like API server, uh, depending on uh, whatever utility functions you might need. And at the bottom of this slide, there are a couple links that I found helpful when first learning about uh, custom controllers, how to write them. In particular, um, the first link has um, a really helpful diagram for understanding the interaction between the, the informers, indexers, and so on in the Go client. Uh, tip number three, there's really no silver bullet. Um, what I mean by that is that um, control loops are great. Uh, Kubernetes is great. Uh, they only bring you part way to the solution. Uh, for spreading the control uh, loop pattern to a large number of people, you can lower the barrier with uh, tools like MetaController. Um, but at the end of the day, you still have to have a deep understanding of the underlying system. Uh, be unafraid to dive into the source code if necessary. Or, and um, be careful with your experiments. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy uh, writing your own custom controllers and modifying your admission controllers. <laughs>